Well, good morning. It is good to see you guys here this morning. And we're in this new series for this new month of May. And it's called The Best of the Best. And so what we have done here is, is you guys have voted. And you guys have voted on what you, sermons that you like the best. And, and, and I was wanting to do this a couple more weeks. But because of the coronavirus, we were only able to do it one week. So the papers that I got back, this is what you guys have said you wanted to hear again. And so we're going to try this out. And so this whole month of May, we're going to go through sermons that I have previously preached. And so we're going to title this The Best of the Best. Now, this sermon here came from um, the series Spiritual Warfare. And we're going to talk about spiritual warfare and we're talking about standing firm is what our message is going to be on today. So if you will, turn your Bibles in to Ephesians chapter 6. And what we're going to do is I'm going to pray as you're going to turn there. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Be with us and guide us and protect us. It just help us to bring glory to your name, dear Heavenly Father. It helps us to love you all the more, dear Jesus. And just prepare our minds for spiritual battle here this morning. We just love you. We thank you. We give you all the praises and the glory. And it's in your most holy name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of background into uh, the book of Ephesians, and especially into Ephesians chapter 6. He goes through here to start off with Ephesians. It's divided up into two sections. The first three are theological in essence, and then the last three chapters are more of the practical ways of living. And so here in chapter 6, what he has gone over and starting to go over is the mystery is revealed. Now, what is the mystery? Okay, the mystery is salvation. And so salvation is revealed. You see, before Christ, we knew that salvation existed. We knew that it happened. We could even knew how it happened, that we had to have faith. But we didn't know exactly what was going to partake or take place in order for salvation to happen. But after Christ, we learned what is going to take place in salvation. Okay, and that... Um, uh, here that Jesus Christ is going to come, he's going to live, and he's going to live the perfect life. About is this mystery is revealed. Okay, and so here um, the mystery is revealed here, and so we learned about salvation, and then he's going to walk, walk in unity is the second thing that he goes over. And so here, once we know about salvation, then he tells us how we are to, to walk in this unity and to live together and how we are to live. And he then goes into describing what a healthy church looks like. And, and so he's going to describe this for us. And uh, then he's going to talk about how we are to walk in love. So once we know about salvation, once we know how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to act, then we're supposed to go out and we're supposed to love one another. And everything we should do should be in love. And then he talks about Christ and the church. And so this is where we come into right here is Christ and the church. And so what he does here is, is he's going to give us the armor of God. He's going to tell us how to combat spiritual warfare. And it is important for all of us to understand and all of us to know how to combat spiritual warfare. So if you will read with me on verses 10 to 20. Of, of Ephesians chapter 6 it says this finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the powers against the worldly forces of the darkness against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places therefore take up the armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you'll be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert, with perseverance and petition for the saints, pray on my behalf, that the utterance may be given in the opening of my mouth, 
to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, and in proclaiming it, may speak boldly as I ought to speak. All right, and so here in this section here, he tells us how to fight a spiritual battle. And the whole purpose of the church is so that we will learn to fight this spiritual battle. And so here, the church of Ephesus did not start out as a mighty church. What they have done is they took heed to the words of Paul and they became a mighty church. Now, these principles are still true for us today. They can transform our lives. And you today can become spiritually powerful in, in, your, in your walk with Christ. So if you'll read with me, we're going to read verses 10 to 12 again. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against ruling forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. He tells us here that we are to put on the armor of God. We are to get dressed. Okay, we are to get dressed with the armor of God. And so this is what we are to do. And so there are reasons uh, for fighting. And, and so he gives us these four things in which we are fighting against. These four things that we are fighting against, the first one is this. The first one that he comes with is principalities. Principalities, this is ranked demons. Okay, and so they are ranked uh, according to their own organization. I want you to understand something, that Satan is very organized. Okay, he knows what he is doing. The second thing that we are fighting against is powers. Okay, and the powers is ability, control, and influence. The devil is trying to trick you. The devil has power. I want you to understand that. That Satan does have power. Okay, and he is, has an organization there and it runs extremely well. The third thing that we are fighting against is rulers of darkness. Okay, these are secrets and deceptions. Okay, and we learned here that Satan is a trickster. Okay, the schemes of the devil. Okay, and so he's going to try to trick you. He's going to lie to you. He's going to try to deceive you. Okay, this is the whole uh, emphasis on which Satan runs and the way Satan works and the way Satan acts. And the fourth thing that uh, we're going to uh, go against is spiritual forces of wickedness. Okay, so these are demonic plots okay, that we are fighting against. So Satan has a plan and he's going to act on this plan. And he knows his plan. And, and the demons know the plan of Satan. And they're going to plot against you. Now, have you ever noticed that there are some things in your life that just don't bother you? That you don't have a problem with when it comes to temptation wise? There's some things that you just do not have a problem with whatsoever. Those things, Satan doesn't really attack you on. Okay, it is the ones where you're weak in, in which uh, he is the one where he attacks you at. So I want you to read verses 13 and 14 with me today. It says this, Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, Girding your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So this is where we're going to spend the remainder of our time. And so I titled this section here to stand firm. Okay, And so we are to learn to stand firm. And so he starts off in verse 13. He says, therefore, this is an important word um, that means this. Since we are fighting spiritual warfare, therefore... Okay, since Satan is a schemer, since he is a deceiver, since he is going to trick you, therefore, okay, since he has demons and they are, are ranked and they have plots and they're going to try to tempt you, 
Therefore. So therefore is a, a big word in, in verse 13. But he says this. Therefore, take up. Now this is a command. This is a command for us to put on daily. Okay? And so uh, here we're to take up the armor of God. So every day we have to be ready to put on the armor of God. Okay? Every day is a spiritual battle for us. And we, we can only win, as verse 11 and 12 says, through His might. And so every day we have this command to put on the armor of God. It says put on the full. I want to emphasize the word full. This is all of the armor. Not just a piece or two. Okay, but all of it. It is important that we understand that we're to put on the full armor of God. Put all of it on. Don't lack anything. And then this is the reason why I like the NASB is this next phrase. So that. Okay, very few translations put those two words together. Okay, but so that in the NASB, this is a, a flashing light that says purpose, purpose, purpose. Okay, it's going to give you the purpose. There is a reason and there is a purpose for putting on the armor of God. Okay, and that reason is, okay, so that you, okay, so everybody take your finger and point at yourself and say me, okay, you, so, so that you will be able to resist. Now, our focus for the spiritual battle is upon us. Okay, and so we have to be focused on ourselves. Okay, and so I have to put on my spiritual armor every day. You have to put on your spiritual armor every day. It's not my wife's job to make sure I put on my spiritual armor. It's not my kid's job to make sure I put on the spiritual armor. This is for us to do. The purpose is, the purpose of the full armor of God is so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. Now that word resist, to you and I, doesn't mean a whole lot. Okay? Uh, but in the Greek, this means to fight off, it means to battle, and it means to conquer. So it means that you're going to go to battle, but you're not going to go to battle and be wounded and just come out barely making it. No, it's to overwhelmingly conquer. And, and when I see this word, the way it's used, I kind of think of the Six Day War. You guys remember the Six-Day War, or hearing about it? And the Six-Day War, what we had is, is we had Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. All three countries are going to decide, we're going to attack Israel. And we're going to overthrow Israel. And we're going to defeat Israel. We're going to attack on three different fronts at the same time. And there is no way on earth that Israel is going to be able to stand. There's no way they're going to be able to resist, Right? But as you all know, the war only lasted six days. It was a very fast war, very quick war. And Israel conquered. They came out on top. And I heard stories that were miracles took place, that God's hand was on it. I'm not denying that at all. I'm not denying that God wasn't there okay, and that He didn't cause certain things to happen. Okay, I believe that God was protecting Israel that day. But you see, they were able to resist. Not only did they, they fight the battle, but they overwhelmingly conquered. We are to do the same thing. We are in a spiritual battle every day. And we are to overwhelmingly conquer. We will be able to resist. Now let me ask you a question. Are we able to resist on our own? The answer is no, isn't it? Turn with me to the book of James. James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. It says this. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, O sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so here, the way that we can resist, it says here, is first off, it says, submit therefore to God. We've got to submit ourselves to God. If we want to resist Satan, if we're going to resist the devil, it is important that we submit first to God. If we don't submit to God, it is useless, it is hopeless, because we will not win against Satan on our own. 
Okay, it says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We can't resist on our own. We have to have the work of God. Back in verse 13, it says this. So that you'll be able to resist in the evil day. Now, when is the evil day? Okay, when is the evil day? Every day since the fall of man is the evil day. Since man fell in the garden of Eden, every day since then is the evil day. This is why we have to put on the full armor of God every day. It's because every day is an evil day. Every day Satan is allowed to have dominion. And, and again, this is something that you're going to have to argue with God and ask God why. I don't understand why Satan has such dominion over, over the world. But that's just something that you'll just have to ask uh, the Heavenly Father when you get there. But I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Talks about our state before Christ. It says that you were dead in your sins and transgressions. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the air, of the spirit now working in the sons of the disobedience. Okay, and so here, the prince of the air is Satan. So Satan has dominion. Okay, he is in, has a charge. Okay, he's the prince of the power of the air. And again, if you'll turn with me to the book of John, John chapter 12, verse uh, 31. John 12, 31. It goes and says this, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of the world, Satan, will be cast out. Okay, and so here, uh, we do know that Satan's rule is going to come to an end. He's not always going to have dominion. Right now we live in the evil day where he does have dominion. And this is why we need the armor of God. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a day that just seemed to be against you? A day that just was not your day. Everything in that day went wrong. Everything was bad. It was just a horrible day. You get up, you get your kids up, you get ready to take them to school, and, and the kids are running behind, they're, they're not ready, they're not dressed, and, and, and finally you get the kids, you're already late for school, and you, you get them into the car, the car won't start, you know, and so by the time you get them to school, they are really late, and then you're late to go to work, and it just seems like everything's piling against you. There was a meeting right at 8 o'clock that you're supposed to be at, and you weren't there, you were late. Okay, there's, there's these days like that, isn't there? This, my friends, is the work of Satan. Satan wants you to have a bad day. Satan doesn't like it when you're enjoying life. Satan doesn't like it when you're uh, praising God. Satan doesn't like it. He wants you to have a bad day. Satan wants you to be depressed. He wants you to be filled with anxiety. He wants you to have fear in your life. He wants you to be frustrated in life. The reason being is Satan wants you to give up. He wants you to retreat. But I'm here to say, don't give in to Satan. We may live in the evil day, but don't give in to Satan. He does not have the final say. So back in verse 13, we continue on. He says this, and having done everything, and having done everything. So what is that? What is, what is everything? And what does that mean, having done everything? Okay, this means that you have put on the full armor of God. This means that, that you are living in the will of God. This means that you're, you're living the life of obedience to God. This is everything. Okay, once you strove, strive for all these things, you have done everything. And then he says here in verse 13, stand firm. Now this word stand firm means not to be moved. To hold your ground. To don't give up anything. Now, how many of you guys like football? You guys like football? Yeah, I love football. I love watching the Kansas City Chiefs play football. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But what you want is you want your defensive line to stand firm. 
You want them to stand their ground. You don't want them to give up anything. And you want them to be able to hold off the offensive line, shed, uh, shed their block, and go after either the running back or the quarterback. That is what you want from your defensive line. Okay? You want them to stand firm. Okay? The game is won or lost on the what? Line of scrimmage, right? Okay, so the, that's where the battle is. The battle is the line of scrimmage. And you want your defensive line to persevere, to prevail. And this is what I think of when it says stand firm. Don't let anything get past you. So let me ask you another question. Can you stand firm when you're weak? And can you stand firm when you're sick? Can you stand firm without the armor of God? You see, if we don't put on the armor of God, we are going to be weak. If we don't put on the armor of God, we're going to be sick. Okay, there's going to be things that we cannot do if we're not having the armor of God on. So if we refuse to put on the armor of God and to put on the full armor of God, we will not be able to stand firm. We will not be able to be exposed and protected by the power of God if we do not put on the full armor of God. So everything we're to do, we're to stand firm. Verse 14, he starts off and he says this. Stand firm, therefore. Okay, so he just got done talking about stand firm and he mentions it one more time. So for the third time in four verses, okay, the third time in four verses, the Apostle Paul calls the Christian to take a firm position in the spiritual battle against Satan and against his demons. Verse 11, verse 13, verse 14. All three, four of the, well, three times in four verses, he tells us to stand firm. Now, the best thing about fighting is knowing your enemy. So if you're going to be in a fight and you're going to, to battle someone, battle something, then you want to know a little bit about them. Uh, for my son, when he plays chess, he, he knows these opponents. He sees these opponents. Okay? And he has to learn their strengths and their weaknesses before he goes and he battles them. He's got to know and predict what they are going to do so he can counter what they're going to do and then know what their weakness is going to be in order to strike. We're the same way. Okay? We are to know our enemy. And Satan is our enemy. So what are Satan's efforts going to be? This is something you can ask yourselves. This is something that we need to know. We need to know our enemy if we're going to fight our enemy. We need to know his strengths. And we need to know what he's going to be doing so that we can counter him. And we need to know the weaknesses so we know how to prevail. So if we can understand Satan's methodology or his plan of attack, then we will be able to fight against him. There are eight things that Satan is going to try to do to you. In Satan's methodology, there's eight things. The first one is this. First, one, first thing he's going to try to get you to do is distrust God. If he can get you to not depend and not trust in God, he's going to do well. He's going to win. What was the first thing that he did with Eve? What's the first thing he did there? Okay, he, he goes to Eve and he says, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden? Well, that's not what God said, is it? And so here, Eve, who didn't hear directly from God, and she, God told Adam, Adam told Eve, he gets her to distrust God. So that's his first plan of attack, is to get you to distrust God. Second thing that he's going to try to get you to do is to forsake obedience to God. Forsaking your obedience to God. If I start to distrust God, am I going to be obedient to God? No, am I? I'm not going to, am I? It doesn't make sense. If, if I'm not trusting someone, am I really going to be on their side? Am I really going to be obedient? Am I really going to be striving to do what they want me to do? No. So the second thing is, is he's going to try to get you to forsaking obedience to God. To get you not to trust Him and not to follow after Him. The third thing is that He's going to do is producing doctrinal confusion and falsehood. Is this around today? 
I mean, my goodness. It is all over the place, isn't it? We, we have people who, who pastors, excuse me, pastors who won't preach on sin and won't preach on repentance, which just, just baffles my mind because I'm like, these are the two things in which you need to preach on the most. Okay, is we need repentance. We need to repent of our sins. Sin is the only issue that needs to be dealt with. And here's pastors, people who call themselves pastors, and I probably should use that term very loosely, but they call themselves pastors and apostles and prophets, and here they won't preach on sin, and they won't preach on repentance. So they, they produce this doctrinal confusion. Satan's using them to produce doctrinal confusions and even falsehoods. I mean, how many different types of doctrine do we have out there? I mean, Trinities, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity, all right? And so there are people who say, such as the Mormons, that there is no such thing as the doctrine of the Trinity. There's three gods. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? They are all separate. They are different. Well, that's not what the Bible says, is it? Now, here's what they'll say. They'll say the word Trinity is not in the Bible, and they are correct, they're absolutely correct when they say that. But the concept of the triune God is in Scripture. And so here we have Satan who's producing doctrinal confusion and falsehood. The fourth thing that he's going to get you to do is you're going to try to hindering your service to God. Okay, hindering your service to God. If I don't serve, if, if I'm a believer and, and I decide, you know what, you know, I'm... I'm good. I've been doing nursery for, for however many years, and I, I'm, I'm good. I'm just not going to serve anymore. I've served my time. I pay my dues, and I'm just not going to do that anymore, and I'm not going to serve God. This is a work that Satan tries to get you to do. He tries to get you to where you won't serve. And if we don't serve, we become ineffective in the ministry of God. So he's going to try to get you to become ineffective in the work of God. He's going to try to get you to where you don't serve God. And where you don't serve others. That's going to be the work that Satan is going to try to do. And try to get you to fulfill. The fifth thing he's going to do is bringing division. Oh my goodness. Has, has anybody ever known a church that has split or divided? I mean, has anybody known that? Yeah, of course we have. We, we hear about these things. Okay, and how these different churches... Split. And they they fought over whatever issue, and, and a lot of times it seems to be silly issues, like color of the carpet. I mean, who cares about the color of the carpet? But yet churches have split over the color of the carpet, and it just seems silly to me. But I know it happens because this is the work of Satan. This is what he tries to do. I mean, there's been towns that have had. First Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church, Third Baptist Church, okay? I mean, it's, it's not just a Baptist Church thing where splits and divisions happen. It's every denomination that splits and divisions take place. This is the work of Satan. Here's number six. Living hypocritically. Living hypocritically. Now, what Satan desires, he doesn't really care if you go to church, so to speak. So to speak. That's fine. You can do that. But he doesn't want you to tell all your co-workers. Okay, so you can be Christian on Sundays. But if he can get you ineffective during the week. And nobody knows that you're a believer. He's, he's doing well. Okay, he's getting to where you living hypocritically. Or, or even to where you're one way on Sunday and totally different during the week. Number seven. Living or being worldly. Okay, if you're striving to be like the world and living like the world. You know, Romans 12, 2 says that we are to be conformed to the image of God. Okay, and so not to the world. We're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, and so he, he's going to try to get you to, to live like the world and be like the world and, and to desire the things that the world wants and, and to put your stock in, in those type of things instead of putting your stock, stock in the things of Christ. And the things that God desires of you. And the lastly, lastly is this. Number eight is rejecting biblical obedience. Man, if he can get you to where you don't 
become obedient to the Bible. Don't become obedient to Scripture. And he's doing good. He's doing well. But he's going to attack in these eight areas. Okay, and so I, I want you to know. I want you to be prepared. And, and I want you to know your enemy. And know how he is going to attack. So that you can come against him. And the way we come against him is by putting on the full armor of God. That is the only way in which we're going to be able to resist in the evil day. To be able to conquer in the evil day is to have on the full armor of God. This is a decision I have to do all the time. Okay, I have to constantly say, all right, I've got to put on the armor of God. I got to take up my cross and follow after him daily. This has to happen daily to do this. The armor of God is our defense against all of these things that Satan is going to throw at us. Okay, and so I want you to be prepared. I want you to be properly dressed. I want you to have on the armor of God. And so in verse 14, he's going to start to go over these things. And he says this in verse 14. Girding your loins with truth. Now, a Roman soldier, they wore a tunic underneath. And they went all the way down to their, their ankles. Okay, And so if you were going to run, you had to cinch up your tunic. And you had to pull it up because you were entangled. That tunic entangled your ankles. You were not able to run. You could walk, but you were not able to run into battle. The tunic became a hindrance to you. Okay, and this is why um, Hebrews 12, 2, it talks about getting rid of all the things that are so easily entangled in. And so I think he had a picture of that Roman soldier tunic in mind. Okay, it's easy to trip over. It can make you fall. Okay, and so we're to cinch those up. And what, what they did is they grabbed them and they cinched them up into their belts. Okay, and so they were girded, which means that they were prepared and ready for battle. Okay, they were ready now. There was no hindrance with the Roman soldier now. The, the belt was holding up the hindrance. And the belt is truth or truthfulness. So the idea is that we must have a sincere will to fight and win. Not just fight, but win without hypocrisy. Truth is the first thing mentioned in the armor of God. Okay, and so here we are to have truth about us. Everything in the Roman soldier was connected to the belt. It was all connected to the truth. Okay, and so the truth is the, the first thing that is mentioned, and it is probably one of the most important things. And everything fastened to the truth. Now turn with me to the book of John. John 14 says, it says this, and Jesus Christ says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Okay, so he says here, that he is the truth. Okay, so Jesus Christ is truth. In him there is no deceitfulness. There is no lie. This is one of the reasons why we believe that the word of God is inherent. It is without error. It is without uh, falsehood in the word of God because God is truth. Okay, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so since Christ is truth, we are to we have the, the truthfulness of Christ about us. And then the next thing he mentions there in verse 14, back in Ephesians, is he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate, it covers the torso area, protecting the heart and the lungs and the vital organs. Righteousness, or holiness, is such a distinctive character of God. He is righteous, he is holy. I mean, he's, God describes himself as holy. He says this, he says... Be holy, for I am what? Holy. Okay, be holy, for I am holy. Okay, and so uh, the, the central attribute of Christ, the main characteristic of Christ is holiness. Because God is holy, He is everything else. Because He is holy, He is love. Because He is holy, He is wrath. Okay, and so uh, everything stems from God's holiness. And so that's what 
this is, this righteousness or this holiness, this breastplate of righteousness. So as we live in obedience to God, it is His righteousness that protects us. Okay? It's His holiness that protects us. A lack of holiness is going to leave us vulnerable. Okay? And so it is important that we have on the breastplate of righteousness, which looks to the truth. So we see how they go hand in hand. Now I want you guys to stand firm. And the way we stand firm it is by putting on the armor of God. We know that Satan is going to attack us. We know that we're going to, we live in a day that is evil, okay, in which he has dominion. And we know we have learned how he is going to attack us. And our only way of defense is the armor of God. So I want you to stand firm. And the only way to stand firm is with his help and by trusting and depending upon him and putting on the full armor of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for today. Guide us and protect us, Lord Jesus. Help us to stand firm in our faith, to give up nothing. We know that we're going to be attacked. We know that Satan's out there and he has his rulers and authorities and his, his dominions, Lord Jesus. But there's one thing that I know. You are greater. There's no one greater than you, Lord Jesus. And I pray that we will put our faith and trust in you whether we are a believer or a non-believer, Lord Jesus, today. That we will strengthen our faith. That we will learn to stand firm. We will learn to put on the full armor of God. We will learn to trust in you and to depend upon you so that we'll be able to fight against the schemes and the trickeries of Satan. Lord, we know that he's real. Just give each of us the power that we need to be able to combat Satan and his dominions, Lord Jesus. I just thank you for this day and this time. I thank you for everyone who's hearing my voice. Just be with us as we go from here. Help us to follow in your ways, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.